You're watching Vintage Motocross q and I'm Joe Abadi, and I have a very, very interesting guest with me tonight. His name is David Dewhurst. Mm-hmm. He is a world-renowned photographer who not only covered motocross world from the 1970s, but he also raced while all that was going on in 1976. David started a British weekly newspaper called Trials and Motocross Newspaper. He was also, uh, he was very, very involved with the magazine Cycle Guide magazine in the 1980s. We've got so much to talk about, but the thing we're here to talk about today is his book, Motocross, the golden era. Stick around. I'll be right back with David Dewhurst. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining me at Vintage Motocross Q&A, and I want to welcome my guest, Mr. David Dewhurst. Good evening. David, uh, a happy, well, it's almost New Year, but a belated Merry Christmas and an early Happy New Year to you. Same to you. You've done a lot of things in your life. You've raced motorcycles, you've been a photographer, and now you're a published author. Uh, Before we get into the questions, though, you know, your generosity, especially this time of year, is really, really incredible. So before we get started, what I want to say is that David Dewhurst, my guest tonight, has given us this book, Motocross the Golden Era, to give away on the show. But we sometimes, in fact, every week we give away something on the show, some kind of gift from one of our sponsors, Motion Pro, Vintco, or whatever. This book is very, very unique, absolutely a collector's item. We're going to be giving it away to one of our viewers. In order to find out how that's going to happen, go back to the Vintage Motocross Q&A page. You'll see what to do. We're asking you to share it on your page, tag David and myself, and we will have uh, a winner of that book within the next week. Now we can get right down to uh, asking the author some questions. Let's start with David uh, a little bit more about your career and how you got started. One of the things that uh, interested me was this Trials in Motocross News, which started in 1976. Where did that begin? How did that begin? How long did you do that? Well, it all began, um, I'd been racing motocross for probably five or six years, seriously racing motocross five or six years. And uh, I worked at a local provincial newspaper as a photographer and the boss's son joined my our motocross club back then and uh, just an amateur club and i was talking to the boss one day and said you know there's a huge lack of coverage for motocross and anything off road uh, in england there, there, there was there were two lo- two big newspapers national papers and uh, but they didn't really cover much of motocross so i said you know there's such a, a gaping hole here we could do something and you know, God love him, he actually stuck his neck out and said, well, yeah, let's give us a try. So we we started, we, we did a dummy issue and uh, in set the end of 76, and it was... And this uh, is in the UK? This is in the this, UK, David? This, this is in the UK, yeah. We were okay. just, just in England. Um, okay. And, but the idea was just to try and get everybody involved, have stuff from race events, results, photographs from small events, big events, whatever it was, just but an all-inclusive off-road for trials of motocross and enduro stuff. Um, so we did the dummy issue, sent it out there, and there was just a huge response. Luckily, there was a huge response from the industry too. Kawasaki stepped in immediately and said, yeah, we'll take lots of advertising. And you know they really bankrolled the thing for, for a while. Um, so we started, and it became just an instant huge success. At, at some point, they were selling over 40,000 copies a, a week. It was a weekly newspaper. And you were having these events covered by other people throughout Europe, or how many of them were you were covering? Tell me more about that. Uh, well, the theory, as I said, was to try and do it at a grassroots level, try and get mm-hmm. 
just local events and stuff like that. That was the that was the primary thing to to just have everybody's picture in the paper and everybody's results. So we relied on the clubs to basically send us reports every week, phoned in reports and results and everything. And then it kind of grew from there. We we had people like Alex Hodgkinson was covering all the motocross GPs for us, um, sending us pictures. And this was all pre-internet, you know, so it was... Yeah, 1976, sure. It was, it was a difficult thing. It was people picking up phones. It was guys rushing to an airport to put a roll of film on a plane that would fly back to England or whatever it was. Um, so, yeah, it was a logistical nightmare, but it, it, it all worked out. And there was so much support for it that... Uh, that it just kept growing and growing and growing. And the industry got behind it in a big way, and uh, we, we had just huge support from them. Have Have you seen any of those any of those newspapers from 76 or any floating around yet, like the old Cycle News are or anything like that? <laughs> yeah, they're, they're all over the place. In fact, they I can go on Facebook and go to the old Trials and Motocross News. There's a Facebook page where they're constantly – posting pictures and images and talking about stuff. So yeah, it's all out there. I have some issues downstairs. Um, I had the original issue, the very first issue we did, which in fact, the mock-up issue, the first thing we did was a picture of really? like Nicola jumping uh, on his Husqvarna back then. That was the, the, the lead shot. Ironically, just a couple of weeks ago, 46 years, this is now 46 years after the, the newspaper started, yeah. They they finally folded the newspaper, um, so it. But it lasted for forty six years. The internet kind of killed it. Everything was uh, all the advertising, particularly the bike sales. What was huge was the the uh, all the want ads and the sales ads of, of motorcycles. There was the used bikes in the back of the classified section. Mm -hmm. um, that was just ridiculously big. But that all kind of went away with the with the internet, so it slowly dwindled down. And um, anyway, that's uh, a, a sad a sad note to end on. Okay, it's interesting how your love for motocross uh, <clears throat> and racing cross paths with your photography. You actually went to college to become a photographer. Is that yeah, correct? I did, yeah, I did three years of industrial commercial photography and. I uh, when I left the college, I I got a job at the newspaper. It was the only job I could find at the time, and it was just it was it was just pure luck. Uh, it was that, or I was about to join the air force as a pilot. Um, the day before I got my interview to go to do basic training for a pilot, the night before I got an interview call from the newspaper. So it was just you know life just happens that way. Sometimes just things happen, and you just follow it. So there we are. <laughs> Uh, you also went on in 1980, in the 1980s, you, you moved to California yeah. and you went to work for Cycle Guide as a test rider and a photographer. What else did you do there? Were you married at that point? Give us a little background about what's going on, not only professionally, but personally in your life. Yeah, well, I, I met my wife at the newspaper in England. She worked at the paper as well. Um, and here's a, a funny note, our very first date, if you will, was to go to a Hawkstone Park National Motocross race uh, on a <laughs> very wet, wet and soggy Sunday. So my wife was introduced to this whole mess pretty early on. She should have known better, but she stayed with me. So, um, but yeah, we, so we moved to California. I was actually offered a job. Len Weed was the editor at oh, sure. Dirt Bike Magazine back in the day. Yeah. And yeah. Len, used to, Len used to come over to England every year to go to the Scottish Six Days trial. So as he was as he was driving north up to Scotland, he always came in and stopped off at the office and said hi. So I got to know him well. And one day he just called me up and said, Hey, would you like a job at Dirt Bike Magazine? And I went, Yes, when do I start? He went on up to the Scotland, did the trial, went home, and when he got home, they fired everybody on staff. Mm. Um so that was when uh, Rick Simon became editor, I believe, at that point. Um, so he he felt really bad about having to let me down. And uh, he got hired by Cycle Guy to do a bunch of stuff and heard that they were looking for a technical editor. So he said, hey, here's the guy. He's right here waiting for you. So that was how I got introduced to Cycle Guide. I had to wait 
16 months, I think it was, to get my visa and everything. There was no sliding across the border in Mexico back then. So I had to do it the correct way. And uh, so I ended up in, in L.A. And I was I was technical editor. That was my official title, technical editor. I wrote technical articles, rode the test bikes, and right. did a bunch of the photography. So it was... Uh, it was all encompassing. I did the whole the whole thing. Well, there are a lot of books that have been written about motocross, but not any as comprehensive as yours. Uh, and here it is, uh, motocross, the golden era. I want to know when did all this begin? How did you decide that you uh, you were going to take on this undertaking? You know, it's it's almost five hundred pages. Over yeah. seven hundred photographs, and I want to know, of course, when did you want to? When did you begin to think that you could do this? Which you obviously did do it. Are all the pictures yours? When did all this begin, David? Well, uh, somebody asked me the other day, when did when did it all start? And you know, the picture on the back of the book here is yes. nineteen. Is that you? No, it's it's a friend of ah. mine, Pete, Pete Remington, nineteen seventy two. Uh, at a, a track in the north of England. Um, so, I mean, it, it's, it started a long, long time ago in that I've been shooting pictures forever. And um, I, I, never had a, I never had the idea of doing it really until probably the late 80s when I just had, a, I had down in my office, I have a wall full of pictures of mm -hmm. slides in boxes and things. And I thought, God, I've got to do something with all this stuff. So I had a... From the late 80s, I had this kind of weird idea that I was just going to do a photo book. It was just going to be pictures and whatever. So that kind of festered away in the background. And then eventually somebody, somebody said to me, I can't remember who it was even now, but somebody said to me, you've got to do this. You've got to do the book. So I, I started leafing through the pictures and going, God, this would be great. Yeah, I'll do this. I'll put all these big pictures in here. Motocross riders aren't big readers. They just want to look at pictures. So I'll just, you know, that'll be cool. I'll do the pictures. But as I started going through the pictures and thinking about the captions and everything else, it was like, oh, sure. I've, got do, I've got to do more to explain what all this is about. Um, so it kind of developed into a, a real book, not just a picture book. And then as I started to interview people, for the book and talk to writers and stuff. They all said, well, yeah, if you're going to do this, you've got to talk about this. And if you're going to do that, you've got to talk about that. So it just kind of, it, it just grew naturally and it became this monster, this eight pound monster that you can barely pick up. Um, but it was never, it was never intended to be anything like this initially, but it, it's become, uh, it's become kind of a life's work really, I guess. Well, you know, David, you've also uh, covered 11 MX champions, four championship bikes, and uh, two pioneering organizers. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about let's talk about the bikes first. You you have four championship bikes in there. Why did you choose those four particular bikes? Um, the first one was the Honda, the RC250 Honda, Bob Hanna's 85 factory bike yes it was it was always a you know back in the day i i used to shoot all the supercross races and motocross races through through the mid eight or through the late 80s anyway mm -hmm. and that was always the bike that just fascinated me the most it was the most technologically advanced you know the first thing to have a computer controlling anything on a motorcycle um certainly the first motocross bike anyway and uh, so that was that was the thing that kind of left, led me into shooting some some bikes for the book. Uh, and luckily, Honda still had that, along with a lot of other bikes, in their museum and made it available. The, the funny thing is, when we went in there, a side note, we did a we rebuilt David Bailey's RC500 last yes. year for our, for our race event, the Motocross Revival. Um, when we went into the museum, the original idea was to rebuild Hannah's 250. Um, and they eventually agreed, yeah, you can do that. But somebody went down into the warehouse to check out to make sure it was rebuildable. And I'd noticed when I took pictures that the kickstart wasn't on the bike, which I thought was kind of weird. 
Mm -hmm. So somebody went in and spun the rear wheel and put it into gear, and it just made an awful clanking noise. Turned out there was no piston in there, just a conrod bouncing up and down. Um, they didn't have a piston for it, and they didn't have, more importantly probably, they didn't have the ignition box for that complicated ignition system on that bike. So we never, we couldn't rebuild that bike. But that was the first bike that kind of drew me in. I wanted to do that. I was fascinated by by the technology that was involved with that bike, even though technically it was advanced, but from a results point of view, it was kind of a disaster. It was the, the first one of their bikes that in the early 80s that didn't just totally dominate everything. Um, and then Roger DeCosta, when I, I interviewed Roger uh, for the book and uh, went to his house, went to his office, and mm -hmm. ha he had the one bike, which you know, it's a, a, two years after the bike that's on the cover, but it was the bike that I always looked at as being the quintessential motocross bike. If you, you right. dream of it at night, it was it was that, uh, that, uh, that RH Suzuki. Um, well, sorry, RN Suzuki 500. And he had that one bike still in his garage uh, at home. And uh, he kindly offered to let me shoot the picture of that. So that was the the thing that attracted me for that was it was really a very basic motorcycle, but it was just when I dreamt of motocross bikes, that was the yeah. vision I had. Um, sure. Same same thing. Uh, I interviewed Brock Glover, and he he kindly offered his OW that he'd raced in motocross to nations. It was the only bike he he had, and one of the few factory Yamahas that's uh, left around these days. A lot of those things got crushed. He managed to keep hold of that. It's literally the way it finished the race in Belgium. That uh, I think I have a I think I have a picture over here, David. If you just give me one second, I think this is. This is the bike we're talking about from uh Yeah. Oh don't hang on. Uh, you know, I just don't have the dexterity in my fingers that I used to, it, <laughs> it went I, up and then down again. There you go. Is this it? That's the bike. That's okay. Uh, yeah, the bike that they won uh that he won um the uh, trophy donations on. That's uh, an OW sixty eight factory Yamaha, very rare bike. And uh, again, it was, uh, there are certain bikes that just, you just think of as that's the motocross bike. You know, I think of a, right. a you know, a, 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 a big Mako as an, an early eighties Mako twin shot Mako is just being, it just somehow just excites me. It's just a perfect looking motorcycle. Some of them are way more successful, but they don't always look so beautiful. You know, and that that was the Yamaha. The the Joe Bay, where we did the Joe Bay, George Joe Bay's Kawasaki, his SR five hundred. Um, right. That was sorry a bike. about that. No, that's okay. That was uh, go on. A friend of mine um in Northern California owned that bike along with the bunch of other bikes he has ricky johnson's uh, factory yamaha championship bike and he has a he has a jeff ward factory kawasaki but he had this joe bay bike um and again it's one of those bikes it's just like it's just a monster of a motocross bike and it always the big kawasaki has always excited me because way back in 1978 I got to ride when I was working at Charles Motocross News. I got to ride for a whole weekend uh, the factory 500 Kawasaki um, that was run by the the Kawasaki UK. So I did a test for that bike and got a whole. I, I became a factory rider for a weekend kind of thing, which was which was just an amazing experience and. That bike, because of that weekend, that bike has always kind of fascinated me. The big Kawasaki's have always been a, a love of mine. So there's no, you know, there was no great, there was no great um, theory behind all this. It just, it was things that excited me, and uh, I just love to look at. So I, and I hope yeah. everybody else was going to love it too. Yeah. yeah, David, we are going to take a little break here, here from one of our sponsors, Vinco, and when we come back, we'll be asking you more questions about the book. Is that okay with you? That's fine by me. See you in a bit. All right, David.
Vinco, who already has a full line of vintage parts, now has air shocks that are an exact duplicate of the original air shock so popular in the late 70s. So whether you're looking to build a full racer or museum showpiece, these shocks will give you that incredible 70s look and improve your bike's performance. These new air shocks are fully rebuildable with Ventco rebuild kits and all shocks are hand assembled in the USA with all new components. Every component is brand new. Just like the originals, our air shocks are adjustable with two chambers, high and low pressure, giving you tremendous flexibility for settings of your bike suspension. The Ventco air shocks come fully assembled and ready for installation. Just add air or nitrogen. The kits include the manual and spacers. Visit Vinco.com to check out the air shocks and all that Vinco has to offer to help you get back on track and to keep that ride going. Okay, we're back with uh, our guest, David Dewhurst. David, you know, there's been a lot of books that have been written. Uh, well, there have been a lot of books that have covered motocross bikes, but none of them have given the in-depth history and a look at certain things the way you have. Two things that come to mind are the aftermarket industry, where you've included a chapter from DG, and also some uh, pioneering organizers, uh, and I'll let you talk about them as well. Of all the topics, of all the people, of, of all the things that uh, could have been included, how did you decide on taking a look at the aftermarket world uh, of, of Fox, of DG? How did you come up with that? Well, I had a long list of people I wanted to talk to, and unfortunately, some of them were a little uh, reluctant to rely to emails and phone calls. So it, it narrowed itself down naturally in, in part, and uh, DG was always one that fascinated me. It was just such, mm -hmm. a, it was such a crazy company. It, it kind of exploded on the scene and then just kind of I know it's still around technically now, but uh, as a as a major player, it kind of exploded and then suddenly just went away. Uh, but during that short time that it was at the top, it was just the thing to have. So I always that was always a fascinating thing for me. Um, and I knew Ken Boyko, who was the kind of the sales manager basically down there at uh, DG. So I had that connection with him and. Uh, he was very uh, helpful in letting me, uh, you know, go through some of the records and look at some of the things that they did back in the day. But again, DG to me was just such a pa pioneering company and uh, one that you know nobody will forget in a hurry. I'm afraid. So that was that was why DG. I did Fox again. Yeah. I, I you know Fox is such a strange company in that it literally grew from from nothing it grew from a guy trying to sell used motorcycles in a shop in san jose <laughs> california yeah into this just giant mega corporation one of the biggest clothing companies in the world um and so it, that was a fascinating thing for me was the fact that it went from you know this, this tiny thing to a giant uh, multinational corporation so that you know and, and the other thing too is that it was Jeff and his and his brother was such um, heavy, so heavily into motocross and motorcycles. Yeah. You know, it, it wasn't just something they did as a as a business thing. It was it was also a, a huge hobby until it kind of became a mega corporation. Um, so that you know, those two fascinated me. The the, the other Stu Peters is the one that I did the. Uh, CMC, he, he organized all the CMC races over the years. Probably the most prolific motocross organizer of all time. I mean, he yes. just did, he did, uh, he did races all over the world, actually, but uh, mainly, mainly in US, Mexico, and, and Canada. Um, but he, he, they were doing races like 15 races a weekend around the country all over the place but they became such a huge thing particularly in southern california they became kind of the alternate national motocross championship almost with the uh, yeah with a, i mean they the, any weekend at saddleback park it just looked like motocross national with all the factory teams there and uh, so it, a lot of people outside of Southern California probably don't know a huge amount about Stu Peters, and uh, they've probably heard of CMC, but he had a huge influence on the sport, and uh, and uh, he, he, again, fascinating character. Uh, yeah. And, uh, you know. Now, uh, I just want to take a quick second here. 
David, I want to mention Preston Petty Products. have been a sponsor of our show for uh, almost three years now. So get over to PrestonPettyProducts.com and uh, get yourself some grips, hats, shirts. There's uh, all kinds of things. And believe it or not, they always have fenders at Preston Petty Products. <laughs> David, <surprise>. another, yeah. <laughs> David uh, another person in your book, uh, always flamboyant, often controversial, and controversy still surrounds him until this day, Mike Goodwin. They say the father of Supercross. Mike Goodwin. Um, yeah, it was, I, I interviewed probably 60, 60 different people for the book mm -hmm. and videotaped mm -hmm. all this stuff. Um, Mike, I always want, I always wanted to do an interview because nobody's really done an interview with Mike and yeah. I wanted to do this, but unfortunately he's stuck in a, in a cell in a prison down in San Diego, serving out time for a, uh, a murder conviction on Mickey Thompson. Uh, so I ended up doing the interview with him over the telephone <laughs> at, mm. the, uh, at the prison. Um, and uh, it was the most, uh, it was one of the more colorful interviews, let's put it that way. Uh, he's, uh, he's still a character. He's, uh, he has the memory of an elephant. He remembers every single thing he ever did. Uh, so that was kind of interesting, but it's, he was, uh, <laughs> he'd been such an influ influential part of the business. I mean, sure. he literally invented Supercross. And if you're reading the book, you'll, you'll hear some of the stories about how that all came about. But he, um, he was, he remembered all of the details down to how many fans were at each race at every every one of his event, Supercross events, how much money he spent promoting each race. Um, yeah. And it, the crazy things he did. I mean, one of the things that never happened, and you'll, again, read it in the chapter, is he, he was going to do at the, Supercross, at the LA Supercross in the, the Coliseum. He, yeah. was a, he wanted to have lions roaming around on the track. He wanted to have lions and guys dressed as as Roman warriors with swords trying to hold back the lions. I mean, this was how, this was how crazy and wild that, that Mike Goodwin was. They wouldn't wow. allow him to do it ultimately, but he had, he just had mega ideas before he did all the supercross. He was a, a, a big uh, music promoter. So he did concerts for Rolling Stones and all these huge bands around the world. So he was used to doing crazy, huge events. Um, that's what helped him do the Supercross and make it into such a big thing. But a very, very flamboyant guy, unfortunately, still in prison, still trying to get himself out over, you know, allegations of mistrial and all kinds of things. Yeah. But we'll, we'll see. But Well, that's what's really, really fascinating about your book, too, though, David. It not only covers uh, the motorcycles, the riders, but people like Mike Goodwin, Valentino Ribby, where, where you covered the, uh, the, the suspension uh, of the ribby front end, which is absolutely fascinating. And uh, it, it's just that those things that you've grasped that other books just, just have missed. And I've got pretty much every other motocross history book there is in there on my, on my shelf. But, yeah. but this one just uh, – and again, I think I asked you this question a little bit earlier. I want to ask you again, are all the photographs yours? Uh, there are ninety nine percent of them. Yeah, there are over seven hundred images. Um, I think there are probably thirty, maybe that are uh, from outside people. Um, some old historic pictures, obviously. I, I wasn't around in nineteen twenty four when the first motocross race happened in England, but uh, um, so yeah, there are some some that I bought from uh, some uh, agencies, and a couple of friends have sent me pictures, but uh, the majority of them are mine. Yeah. Were you able to speak with Marty and Nancy Smith before their untimely passing? It's almost three years, and I know you've been working on the book for a while. But did you actually speak to Marty and Nancy while doing getting their their chapter ready for your book? Yeah, um, yes, I did. I mean, I'm, I was blessed to do that. Um, yeah, they. I interviewed Marty at his house. I went up there three times actually to his house uh, outside San Diego. Yeah, ironically. Um, the the last time we were, I, Marty and I were talking about doing a, a his autobiography and for me to r help write the book. And as I left him the last time to go to go home, which was about a, almost two weeks before he was killed, 
Mm. He said, yeah, no great panic. I've got all the time in the world. And, uh, you know, uh, the irony of that just uh, stays with me to this day. But, uh, yeah, I got to I got to sit down with him, and he, he was a fascinating interview. All right. Uh, you know, my good one, Marty Smith, those are, uh, topics are a little heavy and a little bit saddening. Tell me the funniest thing that happened to you while – while doing your research on this book. Certainly something must have come up that yeah. you probably said, I didn't see that coming. Well, I, I, it was the funniest thing, but yeah, I saw it coming. It was Bob Hanna. Bob Hanna is just, uh, okay. he's he's a hurricane of uh, craziness. And uh, yeah, we, <laughs> so we, we sat down with him for a couple of hours and, uh, and interviewed him. And Typical Bob Hanna, he just tells you exactly what's right there on top of his mind. No filters. He doesn't care what he says as long as it's what he really believes. So everything you hear from Bob Hanna is, you know, is really truly what he thinks and believes. And there's, there's, and he's so funny on top of being direct. So yes. uh, yeah, he, he had some great stories. Um, Again, you know, some of those are in the chapter. The, the problem with this whole book is I've got so much information. Trying to squeeze it all into even, you know, 480 pages is really hard. So there's, there's stuff left out. But, yeah, Bob Hanna was – he's always a great interview. Was back in the day and still is to this day. He's just the funniest guy on earth and uh, loved the guy to death. Yeah, uh, I – was with him, Terry Good, and uh, so many other people. Uh, well, it was it was over a year ago now. Went for the yeah. International Motocross Museum, and uh, yeah, he is uh, a bigger than life character. No question, <laughs> no question about that. Uh, I think this question. Well, David, are you? And well, I have more questions for you. We're going to be talking yeah. about more stuff, but it, it just crossed my mind. Are, are you mailing these books out yourself? How many of these books do you have at your house? <laughs> Yeah, I, <clears throat> we printed 3,000, which was, uh, at the time, I thought, God, that's so many books. And everybody told me, no, don't do any less than that, you know. So, yeah, we, um, <clears throat> a truck pulled up to my, to the front of my house with uh, nine pallets. It was almost eight tons of books. And, wow. Uh, yeah, we load, offloaded those. I rented a forklift, and we we offloaded those. And my garage is full from front to back and top to bottom. With uh, I don't actually, I don't even have all the books. There are another seven hundred that are on the way. So yeah, we're uh, we're we're up to the roof with books. And yes, I've I've mailed every one, and to this day, I've autographed and signed and inscribed every single book that's gone out. So it's uh, it's yeah. It, yeah. I, I have mine, and it is autographed directly to me, and I have the other one that we'll be giving away on the show, and uh, it does have your autograph on it as well. What made me ask the question was because I had Martina Falta, uh, yeah. Faltova Cope. She was on my show, uh, I guess it was about a month ago, and yeah. she's printed a much smaller book, uh, the, the stolen uh, the stolen title about her father, Jaroslav mm -hmm. Falta, but she said she has 5,000 of those books, and she's also uh, stuffing envelopes. Yeah, uh, much like much like you have, but you have, of course, have that box and an eight pound book, and uh, yeah. yeah, it's uh, yeah. it's it was quite a large undertaking. Where are you selling these books, David? Is it big in America? Is it is it big abroad? It's uh, the biggest. Yeah, probably. Um, I haven't looked at the latest numbers, but yeah, most of it is in America. But I sold a lot in in England, a lot in Australia, Belgium, Italy, New Zealand. I mean, it's uh, it's gone all over the world. Uh, Japan. Um, so, yeah, there is uh, Roger. You and Roger? Uh, that was at the book launch. We did a, a launch party a couple of weeks ago when the books mm -hmm. finally arrived. And uh, again, Roger, very, very generous as ever with his time and helped uh, help me with uh, both the interview and things like this event that uh, attract everybody's attention. Obviously, people all want to see uh, then the, there's Bob himself. That was uh, that was at Glen Helen at the Vet Nationals when he showed up for for that event. He's again all these people. Like you know, I have to say, all the people that are in the book have just been so helpful, uh, given their time and energy, and uh, I, I can't thank them enough. I I was just down at Jeff Ward's house uh, two days ago, um, and he's just autographed a bunch of books. I'm going to do I'm going to do a special batch of 10 books, just 10, 
that will be autographed by as many of the people as I can get to autograph the book that were in the book and, and some others that weren't in the book. I'm going to have 10 that are just covered in autographs by, you know, famous people. And, uh, and then we're going to have one that we're going to auction off probably through road to recovery. And, okay. Um, so we're going to have that, that's going to be available in a month or two's time, as soon as they can get everybody to autograph the books. Um, the book that you just saw Bob Hanna holding up was uh, auctioned off for Road to Recovery after the Vet Nationals. And I was talking to them yesterday or a couple of days ago, and they said that was one of the highest bids they'd ever had on any How much item. did it raise? Do you, do you know how I much it raised? Know. She, no, she didn't tell me what it was, but she said she was blown away by just how how much people were willing to uh, to donate for, you know, for the cause. So... Hopefully, sure. when we get this other book signed and autographed, it'll be you know similarly. It'll go for a lot of money and help all those injured riders that are uh, they're in need of some financial help. So yeah, I hope so. To that. Yeah, and uh, I'm wondering is uh, Racer X magazine? They must have a plug for you in their magazine. Racer X been a sponsor yeah. of our show for a couple of years now. I'm sure they must have uh, put put something about your book in their in their monthly publication. They have indeed, and, and in fact, some of the, the a few of the, the photographs that aren't mine uh, came through Davy Coombs at Racer X. Uh, big thank you to to Davy. Uh, they were Rick Miller's, uh, sorry, Dick Miller's uh, photographs from back in the day. Uh, so there are some of the some of the images are from Dick Miller for, again from stuff before my time or before I came to the states anyway in 1980. So yeah, they've been a big help. You also have an interactive part uh, on your website about the book where people could leave a review or talk about yeah. the book. That yeah. is on your on your website. Is that on your Facebook page? Where is that, David? It's on uh, motocrossthegoldenera.com, the website. Just uh, one, all one word, motocrossthegoldenera.com. Yeah, I was trying to get people involved, you know, beyond just buying the book and sitting there watching sure. it. Trying, trying to get a community of people talking about it. There's been, a, you know, crazy positive response to the book i didn't expect so much praise and and good stuff happening from the book to be very honest but it it is uh, it's heartening to to get so many positive things so yeah trying to get people to uh, to join together and discuss this thing and as i mentioned in one of our emails earlier the, the thing about this whole book and you know motocross in general is it's kind of sad that we've we've just seem to have ignored motocross history and motocross has become you know whatever's tomorrow's fastest shock absorber or you know what, what's the latest yeah it's all, it's all about foot foot pegs and graphics yeah and i mean uh, yeah like i mean that's what it's all about these days yeah. and, and nobody knows anything i i won't name names but uh, but a, a famous motocross champion uh, not too many years ago was at a race that I was at, and uh, somebody mentioned um, somebody mentioned Barry. Uh, um, sorry, uh, Gary Jones. Right, and they said Gary who? Gary what? They had no yeah. idea who Gary was. You know, for our first motocross champion, and right. uh, uh, you know, I, a, a twelve-year-old kid. Yeah, I can understand. But when you're a when you're a motocross champion, you kind of go, well, maybe I should know something about the sport. You would hope that they would. So the 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 lack of knowledge about motocross history is is a sad thing for me, and I. And I'm hoping that this at least might make people think about it a little bit more. But I think the industry has done a terrible job. And we, just as participants in the sport, I think have kind of neglected to promote the sport. You know, you go to a baseball game and ask some 12-year-old kid who, you know, who Mickey Mantle is, and they'll, you know, they'll, they'll know. Sure. They'll know the name, at least. They'll know something about him. You know, if it's anything older than two years ago, most kids today have no clue about motocross history, and I, I that really saddens me. Yeah, well, that's why I think books like uh, like Motocross: The Golden Era that you have written. That's why I think projects, big projects like the International Motocross Museum, which is a yeah. huge undertaking by by Terry Good. I think that's why these things are absolutely important. And and, and as the sport grows, and, and I think it is growing with with Supercross. I, I think it is yeah. growing. Uh, we, we need to have, 
you know, we need to have our Cooperstown. We need to have our Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, so to speak. David, I got to take a little break here from here from our sponsor, Motion Pro, and then we'll continue on talking with David Dewhurst. We'll be right back after this message. Thank you, Motion Pro. And starting the first of the year, we're going to be having a big discount just available to the Vintage Motocross Q&A viewers. Big discounts across the board on everything from Motion Pro. We'll have an announcement about that after the first of the year. David, it took you a while to write the book. You've got 8,000 copies. You're selling them all over the world. It's a huge undertaking. And I would think a guy like you would say, that's it. I'm never doing that again. But you're writing another book. Yeah, I, I <laughs> <laughs> nobody ever said I was clever. Um, yeah, I've, I've already I've already started uh, working on some stuff. I mean, we're, we're I've got two a couple of books in mind. Um, one I'm hoping to collaborate with Dave Arnold, who used to be Honda's factory man, team manager. Um, doing it, I, I won't go into detail, but it's a it's a mechanical book about motocross, and uh, which I tentatively called motocross yes it is rocket science um and, yeah you know we'll we'll, uh, we'll leave it at that but yeah i'm working on that in another book um that that uh that was inspired by roger some stuff that roger de costa was talking about so we're 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 working on a couple of books and i have an, even a third book in, in mind but there's only so much you can do. Um, and uh, right now it's, it's all hands on deck, just trying to ship all these books out. We sold over well over 800 books already in, in less than four weeks. So this thing's going really well. And, uh, once, once the tsunami of orders kind of dies down a bit, maybe I have some time to devote some energy to, to the next book. But yeah, I, I want to do, I want to do more and, there's again. There's been there've been so few really good books on motocross. It's 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 kind of weird. I've, yeah. I've got literally almost every one of them. Um, some of them are fairly good. Some of them are just terrible, to be really honest. And some of them, some of them just skim over it so so lightly that you just you you come away just wanting more. But uh, so that's you know that's that's the problem. Yeah. Well, yours yours really does get. Uh get underneath it all and into the stories and into the details that certainly people like me would, would be interested in, in knowing more about. And the other thing is from, from the people that you have, uh, you know, as we do interviews like this, David, as I have a guest like you on my show, uh, or, uh, Gary Bailey or Jack Penton or some of the other people that I've had on in the past, it's nice to have a recording of what they said, not just, something written down and this is pretty close to what I think they said and yeah. then it goes into a book but yeah. to, to have that to have that uh, real foundation that that uh, that real word from the person who was who was really there and it's nice when you said that that Mike Goodwin that he has this memory that is absolutely incredible uh, yeah. who knows maybe he's writing down some things while while he's doing his time there and yeah. uh, whether or not that will ever see the light of day uh, nobody nobody will really know. Who do you want to thank, especially for helping you with this undertaking, David? I'm guessing well, it, Mrs. Um, D Mrs. Dewhurst. Mrs. Dewhurst for putting up for putting up with all all the crap that we've had to go through to make this happen. I mean, it really has been. Is I've been really working on it hard for four years, and uh, I've just been off in the office and nobody's seen me. Um, and then since then, my wife's been folding boxes and taping things up and taking them to the mail. So yeah, obviously my wife uh, and my kids have helped a lot too. Um, but uh, everybody, everybody that I've talked to literally in the business has been just so helpful. And maybe that's because they realize that this is important too, to get some of this, 
some of these words out there and uh, you know get this get the history going. Um, all the writers, I mean, people like David Bailey has been just yeah. incredibly helpful. I've spent many many hours sat with David talking about stuff, and he will. He will tell you about so many details and things, which is partly what inspired the whole idea of doing this next book with Dave Arnold, um, just talking to David about the minutiae of how bikes change and what difference it made to his bike. And, you know, and again, he's a, he's somebody with such a, an incredible memory of every detail of everything he's ever done. Um, mm. So, you know, David's inspiring. Same with Brock Glover. Brock, Brock Glover remembers literally how many clicks it was on the rear shock and just yeah. what the jet, what the main jet was at every race that he ever raced at. Um, so all of these people, every one of them has been just amazingly helpful. And, uh, you know, the guys at Honda for letting us take their bike and rebuild it recently and, and uh, loaning us a bike for the photography. Um, it's uh, the list. I I could just go on for 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 hours about all the people that have helped. So um, it's uh, it's it's been very very satisfying to to see that enthusiasm from everybody. Did you go abroad at all, David, to interview anyone? What so far that you traveled to, to get some of the information for the book? No, I didn't. Um, I I was originally going to do Joel Robert. Mm -hmm. um, Unfortunately, he passed away right as I was about to do it. But COVID was kind of a thing that just got in the way of everything. It was right. Uh -huh. It was both a good and a bad thing. Uh, it uh, it gave me time to do some of this stuff and you know take me away from all the other things that I was doing. But also, it stopped me going to see a lot of people. So, I've in most of the people I've interviewed, I've actually been and videotaped. I've got hours and hours of videotape of. Do you? Most yeah, so you know the Bob Hanna, Bailey Ward, all those people. I have hours, and when I finally get time to do it, we're going to be releasing some of those raw videos. I mean, we'll edit out some of the junk, but it will be basically those raw videos will be available. Uh, we've just been so busy with everything else. I mean, some of them I interviewed Mark Barnett, who's one of the people in the book. Uh, I mm -hmm. interviewed him over the phone. Again, COVID kind of got in the way of going to North Carolina to to interview him. I wanted to do Jimmy Wynett, um, and uh, again, COVID got in the way. A lot of people that I wanted to go and do and see, but you know, ultimately, I've got eleven eleven people in here. Um, yeah, I, I interviewed in total, as I say, probably about sixty people. Maybe thirty of them were were good enough to have gone in the book and you know being important significant people but unfortunately um we there was just not the room for it if i'd been able to go and see all of the people that i really wanted to see in videotape i don't know what i would have done with all that information it was just uh you know it would have been just o overload basically and i don't know what to do with it all yeah well David, I want to thank you for taking the time to come and speak with us tonight here at Vintage Motocross Q&A. And if there's anything else you could think of either right now or in the future, because that always happens. It happened with yeah. Gary Bailey. Like, <laughs> you could always call me and say, hey, Joe, you know what I forgot? And we'll jump back on together and we'll, we'll talk about some more stuff. Yeah. Well, if anybody would just go, wants to go to motocrossthegoldenera.com mm -hmm. or on Instagram, just motocrossthegoldenera. Um, and you know, let's let's get a conversation going about let's let's talk about motocross history and try and try and get this thing moving somehow. So the yeah, so it's uh, the young kids of today know where it all started and what happened. And there it is. And don't forget, we're going to be giving away this book autographed by David Dewhurst, and we're going to be giving it away in the next, uh, I guess, in the next week or so. Either way, check back on the page. You'll see the instructions on what to do. It's going to be something like to share it on your page, uh, a picture of the book, tag David Dewhurst, tag myself, and then we'll figure out who's going to win this beautiful book, Motocross, the Golden Era by David Dewhurst, who was uh, a wonderful guest today. David, thank you for joining me. Thank you. Appreciate it, Joe. Talk to you again. Thank you. And uh, we will be, uh, we'll be talking to David a little bit more. Thanks again, David. All right. Bye-bye.
My guest tonight has been David Dewhurst on Vintage Motocross Q&A. Don't forget to go out there and get a copy of the book, Motocross the Golden Era. Or if you're feeling lucky, you can tag us and uh, get that picture off of our page. You can tag us and uh, we're going to be giving away a copy of it in the very, very near future. So thank you for joining us tonight on Vintage Motocross Q&A. Happy New Year to everyone. Thank you, Jordan, Chelsea, Susie, and everyone that helped us put this show together. Of course, all of our sponsors, Motion Pro, Vintco, Full Circle Racing, the International Motocross Museum, Northwest Mako CZ, Racer X, and Preston Petty Products. Thank you all so much. We'll see you next time on Vintage Motocross Q&A.